G'day guys, Ride here, as Chief Espresso Officer. Today, we're gonna to be looking at the wonderful world of Peru and in Peruvian coffee. Now, Peru hasn't always been known for its specialty coffee. However, they have some fantastic tasting coffees like this one here from San Ignacio. But let's have a look at the rich history of coffee throughout Peru. Now, for those of you who are a little bit rusty on your geography, Peru is located between Chile and Ecuador in South America. And it's a vast range of different and diverse wildlife, wilderness, flora, the whole lot. It's not just about the Andes Mountains, but of course it's famous for its ruins in the Andes Mountains. However, there's a wide range of landscape there from the coast in the east to the Andes Mountains in the middle and the, towards the east. To the west, there's the Amazon Basin. And a lot of amazing animals live all across the country. Most famous are the llamas. Nope, not llamas, alpacas. What's the difference between an alpaca and a llama? I know, they spit. No, the actual difference between an alpaca and a llama can be determined by their ear shape. See, the llamas have the long banana-shaped ears, whereas the alpacas have that shorter, cuter little ears and I think their noses are a little bit shorter as well. So let's not get confused between the two because the alpaca is the animal that's in Peru. But aside from the alpacas, there's also jaguars, pumas and the spectacled bear, which is called the spectacled bear because it actually looks like it's wearing some spectacles. And not only is the wildlife diverse, but so too is the plant life. With a little bit of cacti on the coastals, and then once you move into the highlands, there's these amazing plants called the Puyo Raimondi, which go right up into the sky, miles high. No, not miles high, but they are huge trees. And a lot of people love taking photos in front of them to show off how tall they actually are. Now, the highlands are actually known as Puna, which is interesting because when I started out in coffee 20 years ago, we used to have a drink called Puna and it was a three-quarter latte, or what we now know as a magic. But the interesting fact is that the Highlands Puna translates to altitude sickness, which is funny because obviously it goes up quite high. However, I wonder if it relates back to why we called this coffee a Puna, because it too isn't going to the top of the entire cup, and maybe the coffee itself has altitude sickness. Anyway, interesting side note, but we're not here to talk about the Poya Raimonde or any other plant except for the most fabulous one, coffee trees. Now, the history of coffee in Peru dates all the way back to the 1700s when it was first introduced. And the very first coffee that was introduced there was a heirloom variety called Tipica. Heirloom means that we recognize a coffee that's older than 50 years, but there can be a number of different varieties of coffee within that heirloom range. So Tipica, being the mother of all coffees, first came to Peru, and it's interesting that it came from the Caribbean up near Central America, but it didn't go to Colombia first, which is a closer country. It actually, somehow, it got to Brazil and Peru first before going to some of the other countries, which is interesting, and no one really understands how. Even though they got their coffees growing in 1700s, they drank it locally and they didn't start exporting until about the 1900s. And the reason for this is because what happened in Indonesia and Asia was that there was a decimating plant disease called leaf rust and it just destroyed all the crops of coffees in that side of the world. Europe, being a massive coffee drinker, couldn't wait for them to sort out their issues. So they went looking elsewhere and Peru were ready to go. So they started exporting from Peru and about 60% of their exports were coffee. So they built the economy on the back of those coffee exports. Now, the next bit is a little bit controversial because what happened was Peru defaulted on a loan that they had with the Bank of England. And so in order to offset the pay, they gave up 2 million hectares of land to the English government. And of course, all of the expatriates came over and started buying up the land and exporting their crops. And it was used mostly for agricultural exports for coffee and other plants, but mainly coffee. Now, as with many colonialized countries in South America, a lot of the farms were owned by these British expatriates. They used to export their coffee, but as they sold off the land during the two world wars, they started to buy back some of the land for their own local. And the government eventually paid off their debt 
to the Bank of England and bought back those 2 million hectares completely and then distributed the farms back to thousands of local smallholder farmers. So now in Peru, they're mainly run by smallholder farmers, which is great for us because we get to try these amazing coffees, which I know like this particular one was farmed by only 12 families all the way up in San Ignacio and high up in the Andes Mountains. And just like this particular coffee, they are all organic. Well, 99% of them are. Although you don't refer to a lot of Peruvian coffees as organic, that's only because they don't have the money to pay for those licenses and trademarks. Yes, organic and fair trades are just licenses that people must pay in order to use them on their products. So even though you might get a coffee from Peru that doesn't say it's organic, 99% of the time, the coffee is gonna be organic. Now, what's really interesting about these coffees that we get from Peru, unlike a lot of the other countries, most of the production, the washing, the drying, all happens in their backyards. So these thousands of smallholder farmers will grow their cherries in their backyard. They'll harvest them, they'll depulp them, take all that mucilage off, and they'll wash them, and then they'll dry them out, mostly on tarps underneath the houses. However, as the new technology and their funding increases, they start putting that back into their little farms in their backyards, they create some raised sunbeds. And another thing they build are these drying sheds, which help with the humidity because it keeps it from over fermenting. So this is becoming increasingly popular, and this coffee is growing a lot further. So these 12 families that gave this to us, they actually wash it high up in the Andes Mountains and then send it down to the bottom of the mountain using a 1500 year old aqueduct, which is amazing that we get to sample and try and drink these coffees, which is amazing. And I feel so privileged and special to be able to drink this coffee, knowing that these families work so hard to get it to us. Now, because of the vastness of Peru and the remoteness of all of these little farms everywhere, after they've dried the coffee, they have to take it to a middleman to sell it. And these are called plazas. And the plazas can be good and bad for the farmers because often what might happen, and this is the unfortunate case with smallholder farms, is that they'll go to the plaza and there'll be no other farmers there selling on that particular day. So the plaza or the people who run the plaza, the buyers, they can have a kind of say because there's nowhere for these small farmers to store their goods. So they will say, well, there's no one else here today. You're gonna have to settle for this price because that's all we're willing to take on today. We don't know if your coffee is better than the next person's or not. So this is the price that we're gonna pay for you, take it or leave it. And so a lot of the times they get underpaid. And so we're really trying to change that by educating yourself and educating other people around the world and the farmers themselves they have better storage facilities at their homes that allow them to keep storing it for longer and are also trying to eliminate some of these plazas to help make sure that the farmers can get straight to the exporters with as little amount of middlemen in the way so that they get paid more and the coffee is still delivered around the world. So you're probably wondering how this is possible because it's not easy to just cut out all the middlemen, but what they do is they create co-ops. And these cooperatives allow for multiple farmers to secure better pricing because they pool their resources and they can actually get the best quality coffees separated from the ones that might have a few defects in them. And they secure a higher price and distributes all that money back to all the families that are involved. So it's a much healthier system. And this particular coffee comes from that co-op of 12 families that have built together to provide us these coffees. So let's talk about all the yummy goodness that we get from these coffees here. Now, the majority of coffees, as we said before, are Tipica variety. There's also Katura, Catamore, and a several other bunches, but they take up about 20% of the rest of those coffees there. The main one, and most of the coffees that you'll drink if you're buying Peru and they don't say what variety are on them, it's probably going to be Tipica coffee. What sort of flavors can you expect? Well, it depends on where you get the coffee growing at, because the lower coffees have a lower acidity, but when you go up into the highlands, those really top of the Andes Mountains where it's above 2,000 meters above sea level, that is probably gonna have a higher, more intense fruitiness, a higher acidity. They're all gonna have this beautiful nuttiness to them, as well as some milk sort of chocolates coming through with a light sort of fruitiness coming through at the end, medium sort of mouthfeel on your tongue. 
and they'll have a very sweet aftertaste that lingers for a long time. And depending if you go to the highlands, you'll get this amazing floral aromas coming off the coffees. So that's it for your brief history on the coffee throughout Peru. And hopefully by making these videos, we get the word out and coffee can increase their specialty coffee exports because it is absolutely fantastic. Some of my customers say they always love it and it's not always possible to get it all year round, but when we can, we always get it in from these same families and so that we secure away multiple bags of coffee each year from that supplier so that we can help them build their businesses, reinvest into their own families and farms, educate their entire family as well. If you enjoyed this video and you learned something, please give me a thumbs up or subscribe. It all helps grow this channel and we can help share this information with everyone around the world so that we can all enjoy specialty coffee and stop looking at coffee like it's a commodity or a fuel that to get us up in the morning, but actually an enjoyable drink that tastes sweet, rich in flavor and really helps us as well as getting up in the morning. I'm Ryde, your Chief Espresso Officer. Enjoy your brew.